Hello YouTube. Tamriel is full of interesting characters and I've covered many of them before on this channel. From the last alien king to a mortal mage raised by Daedra, there are just many interesting stories to tell. Some of the more interesting ones that I've covered in the past are those of the three alliance leaders of the Elder Scrolls Online. I've covered Queen Irene of the Dominion and High King Emmerich of the Covenant before, and today we're covering Joran the Skald King of the Ebonheart Pact to complete the alliance leader trinity on this channel. So, let's immediately start. So, Joran the Skald King was born in the year 546 of the Second Era, being one of the three children to the Queen of Eastern Skyrim, Mabjarn Flamehair. He had an older sister, Nernhilde, who was the initial heiress to the throne, and a twin brother named Fildgor. Since an early age, Joran showed great talent and prowess for the arts, and was taught by the most renowned bards in all of Skyrim, which earned him the nickname the Skald Prince, as a Skald is essentially a Nordic bard. He would spend much of his early years as an artist, musician and philosopher, traveling across Tamriel in his scholarly and artistic pursuits and having no real interest in politics, leaving the ruling of the country to his parents and sister Nernhilde. Since he believed his elder sister would take the throne, he just simply harbored no desire for the throne, unlike his twin brother who was ever jealous of his older sister. But Joran craved neither leadership nor power in general. Despite this, his charisma saw Joran become the leader of any creative community he'd join or create, and even became an influential figure in the creative communities of other rival countries. Additionally, despite not being traditionally taught in the ways of war, he was quite a competent and creative fighter and learned much during his travels. Because his travels during this time weren't only made up of song and performance, as he also found himself in quite a few fights. For example, he at one point helped some Argonian slaves escape their slavers in Morrowind together with some of his Argonian friends. Now, in the year 572 of the Second Era, when he was 26 years old, the Akaviri snow demons, the Kamal, attacked Skyrim from the Sea of Ghosts and proceeded to sack the city of Windhelm, which was the capital of the Kingdom of Eastern Skyrim and the seat of Mabjarn, Joran's mother. The defense of Eastern Skyrim was mostly led by Joran's sister, Princess Nernhilde, as apparent heiress to the throne. Now, the news of the attack traveled fast, and when the attack was still going on, Joran, being in Riften at the time, gathered a trusty group of his companions, known as the Pack of Bards, and rode north to Windhelm, together with all the troops he could muster. At the same time, his twin brother also took his warriors and rushed to their sister and mother's aid. The two brothers fought their way to Windhelm, and they fought bravely, but sadly they were too late, arriving just as the Kamal forces reached the gates of the city of Windhelm. The pack of bards joined the battle, but they couldn't prevent the sack that followed, nor the death of Joran's mother and sister. Being forced to retreat, he was heavily wounded and devastated by the losses that he'd suffered. Joran then decided to take the responsibility that someone of his stature should, and he assumed leadership. He made the decision to climb the 7000 steps to High Rothgar and appeal to the Greybeards for help. Surprisingly, and to this day it's not really known why they did this, the Greybeards decided to be proactive and taught Joran to shout. Specifically, they taught him how to summon a spirit from Sovngarde, and when he used the shout, surprisingly, it was the spirit of Wolfharth, the Ash King from Sovngarde, to aid him in his endeavors. Although there is some conjecture on this, as some claim that it was the Tribunal of Morrowind who summoned the Ash King and Joran just took credit for it, although that might also be the other way around and that the Tribunal tried to take credit for it. We don't really know. Anyway, Joran, now having claimed the title of Skald King, as he gathered an army from all of Eastern Skyrim, fortified Riften, assuming that it would be the Kamal's next target. When the snow demons reached the city, they found it too well defended and filled with fierce warriors eager to avenge the sack of Windhelm. The Kamal then deemed an attack on Riften as too risky and therefore turned east to enter Morrowind towards the city of Mornhold. The Kamal however committed a deadly mistake because they assumed that the Nords wouldn't pursue them when they went into Morrowind. But the Nords did pursue them. The Akaviri Kamal army then met the Dunmer defenders led by Almalexia herself in the region of Stonefalls where they were attacked from the west by Jorn's Nord army as they were trying to defeat the Dunmer. A long and bloody battle then ensued, which was essentially undecided until an army of Argonians surprisingly came from the south, because they were warned by the Hist about such a dangerous enemy in the Kamal that they rallied to fight to help their ancient enemies in the Dunmer. 
The tide of the battle was then turned and the Kamal were slaughtered by the three combined forces. Some Kamal were routed and driven to the inner sea only to be drowned by the thousands by a huge tidal wave summoned by Vivek. This battle was the birth point of the Ebonard Pact, although nobody at the time still knew it. Joran then wanted to claim the title of High King in the now rebuilding city of Windhelm. However, there was a slight problem, as Joran's twin brother, Fildgor, who we talked about before, had taken the throne while Joran was on military campaign and wasn't particularly willing to let go of that throne when Joran returned. Fildgor then expected Joran to simply respect his claim, as when the two brothers had quarreled in their youth, Joran would always just give Fildgor his way in the face of Fildgor's passionate fits of anger when it came to it when he didn't get his way. Joran, however, didn't believe Fildgor to be a good king because of his anger fit tendencies, and he then challenged his brother's claim. He didn't particularly want to fight over the crown and rather leaving Fildgor by his side as a talented general and advisor, but Fildgor wasn't willing to let go of the crown and he started summoning his troops to deal with Joran's claim. Joran then saw the writing on the wall and he knew that if he rallied his troops as well, all of Eastern Skyrim would be locked in a civil war. So in order to prevent a civil war, the two brothers then faced each other in single combat in Skyrim's ancient tradition. Now, according to legend, this fight took three hours and would be dubbed the Brothers' War, even though it was only one battle with just two combatants. This duel between the two brothers was fought in the courtyard of the Palace of Kings, which at the time was completely destroyed by the Akaviri sack. Now, this duel was long, bloody and brutal. However, the battle resulted in Jorin rising as the victor after three hours as both men were exhausted. But somehow Jorin summoned a last bit of strength and struck his brother's weapon one last time, which shattered his brother's blade, knocking his brother to the ground and demanding surrender. This resulted in Fildgor, who wouldn't accept a number two position, being exiled by his brother, who was heartbroken by Fildgor's stubbornness. Now, Fildgor would flee, some say to the Daggerfall Covenant, vowing to someday return to take his throne. Then, Joran was finally crowned in the Palace of Kings, and the start of Joran's reign was deemed as prosperous, with peace and diplomacy abound. Especially what he managed to realize on a diplomatic front was quite impressive, as Joran would strive for officializing the alliance between Skyrim, Morrowind and Blackmarsh, born in the battle against the Akaviri. This succeeded, despite the significant cultural differences between the parties, and Joran would be crowned as the leader of the newly formed Ebonhard Pact due to his charisma, wisdom, and most importantly, his diplomatic skills, which could keep these unlikely partners, with years of violence between them, together. I mean, by now we have all accepted the fact that the Ebonhard Pact exists, but we have to give Joran's diplomatic skills some credit here. I mean, the Nords and the Dunmer have fought so much in history that they always cannot dislike each other, and the Dunmer straight up enslaved the Argonians for most of their history. There's a lot of bad blood between these three parties, and the fact that Joran was able to keep this alliance together for several decades into the time of the Elder Scrolls Online is nothing short of a diplomatic miracle. Now, during his time as reigning king, he also had a son, and he called that son Ernskar. Now, Prince Ernskar makes quite a few appearances in the Elder Scrolls Online as an ally to the player, although he can be a bit more hot-headed than his father and has no talent in the singing department, because Ernskar even tells us that his father has always been a bit disappointed that they will never perform a real father-son duet, as the Skald King hasn't given up on his creative outings while he was a ruler. Other than that, not much is known about the period between Joran's crowning and the events of the Elder Scrolls Online, although we do know that he prioritized repairs to the people's houses before that of his own palaces and his own properties, making it so that decades after the Akaviri invasion, the Palace of Kings is still quite damaged, while the city of Windhelm is almost completely repaired. Joran then also makes some appearances in the Elder Scrolls Online, and he is the center of some of the quests in the Elder Scrolls Online's Abenard Pact questline, as obviously his brother Fildgor returned and is now plotting to get the throne back somehow. Uh, you can actually stop these plots as the player. Now, Joran also shows up in the DLC story of Western Skyrim and Markarth, where he is part of the peace treaty talks between East Skyrim, Western Skyrim and the Reach, once again deploying his diplomatic side to solve the conflict. At around this time, he also started trusting his son Ernskar with more and more responsibility, as the Kaskald King himself took on a new lover named Brunhilde, who he wanted to be with as much as possible. At least that's what Ernskar tells us. Anyway, that's about all I can tell you about the Skald King, and I sincerely hope that you learned something new about the Elder Scrolls lore today, and of course, enjoyed the video. That being said, if you want to know the backstories of the other two of the three Alliance leaders, then check out the description of this video, as my video on Hiking Emric and Queen Irene are both in the description. 
along with some other lore videos I highly recommend you watch as they contain some quite interesting ones. That being said, all I now have left to do is vocally thank my top Patreon supporters, Mr. Bernardo Binda, Gabriel Binda, Polarized Poutine, Dragonborn of Nerovar, Athena Hyotis, Volcure of Argonia, King Chris, Scribe of the Scrolls, Doji, Fenrir, Sword of Bushido, Rakai, and Mr. Christmas. It's thanks to these people and all the others on screen that this channel stays alive, and for that I'm very grateful. That said, I hope to see all of you in the next Elder Scrolls lore video. Bye-bye.